Pushkin. Before we get started, let's talk about Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a subscription podcast program available on Apple Podcasts. Members will get access to exclusive bonus content, like my weekly bookmarks, where I talk about how I got a book agent and what I'm watching on TV that week. You'll get uninterrupted listening to many of your favorite podcasts, like Revisionist History, Cautionary Tales, and The Happiness Lab. Sign up for Pushkin Plus on the show page in Apple Podcasts or at pushkin.fm. Well, life is funny. I feel like if your story isn't a little bit funny, it isn't true to life. Born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, author Tiari Jones knows how to find and bring out the humor in her stories, even from the most harrowing of situations. In her critically acclaimed novel, An American Marriage, Tiari tells the story of a young married couple whose relationship is ripped apart when the husband is wrongfully sent to prison. Incarceration is part of the story, but it's not the whole story. It's about people going after their greatest desires. We witness the messiness of their complicated courtships. Tiari uses her words to teach people how to see each other. One thing I want is to write a novel where I'm not telling people how they should act, but instead exploring the different ways that people behave, the different implications, and make us challenge our own beliefs. Welcome to Well-Read Black Girl, the literary kickback you didn't even know you needed. I'm your host, Glory Adam. And this week, I'm speaking with Tiari Jones about the healing power of her work, her long writing process, and the value of sisterhood in her life. Hey, lady. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you as well. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for just always being there for me. You know, the honor and the pleasure is mine. I would love for listeners to hear just like your experience, who you were before you even said, I'm going to be a writer. Just like how reading showed up in your childhood and how books made a difference as a young person. Well, when I was a little girl, I loved to read there was this thing called the Georgia book list. It was a summer list and children got prizes and things for having read books on the list. And so it combined two of my things as a child. I love to read and I also wanted to be the best. And I read all those books and I had a lot of encouragement from my teachers. But I do think that one of the pleasures of being a girl is that you are allowed to get lost in a book because that's considered a girly task. Mm -hmm. And People didn't really process it as an intellectual task, but it was just like, you were a nice girl. I often right. say when you're a teenager, people have two kinds of girls, girls who are nice and girls who are not nice. And reading was a sign of niceness. And it wasn't until I got to Spelman where the question for my life as a teenager was not, are you nice or are you fast? Someone said to me, it was a writer. She was my teacher, Pearl Clegg. Pearl said to me, what are you thinking about? And I got ready to tell her. And she says, no, don't tell me, write it down. Mm. And with that, I gained my first mentor and also my first audience. And I've always wanted to do for someone else what Pearl did for me. She took me seriously. So I then took myself seriously. And that changed me. And, and Pearl and I are still very close. I saw her last week. We get together once a month and we talk. And she often says she's not my mentor anymore, that we're friends. But I say, don't be kicking me out the nest. I demand to stay in the <laughs> nest. And she says, you are nobody's baby bird. But it just <laughs> means a lot to me that I had that. I saw a Black woman who was a writer and she extended her hand to me and thought I could be a writer too. It's so amazing to see how you and Miss Pearl are sister writers and to be a former student of hers and now to evolve to a collaborator, an intense friendship that's grown over the years. How does that feel to witness that friendship and mentorship evolve? Well, 
it's been a long time. When I met her, I was 16 years old and she was an adjunct professor. She wasn't this famous playwright and novelist that she is now. She was an adjunct professor and she did all this avant-garde stuff. She had this thing called Live at Club Zebra. It was like a speakeasy. You know, people were playing saxophones. People were doing things like interpretive dances, naked, like all kinds of things <laughs> were happening. And she read from a piece called Mad at Miles, which was her asking as Black people who love Black people, liberation-minded, how do we address violent misogyny in our own community? Just think this was, what, 1989-ish? So look how far it was before Cosby, before R. Kelly. She was asking these questions. She got up there and she read, and it was quiet. It was, I have to say, it was not met with a standing ovation. It was contentious, but she had made an artistic environment where you didn't have to play to the crowd. You just had to engage the crowd and see where that conversation would take you. I was so impressed. You should have seen me, little on me. You should have seen me and I, <laughs> drink at my Shirley Temple. But <laughs> over the years, she always engaged me, asked me, what do I think about this or that? So in our relationship, even though like she was the big sister and I'm the baby sister, she engaged me and took me seriously so that as we became friends more than a mentor protege, I was accustomed to being heard by her. She taught me that what you want is to tell the truth. And when you tell the truth, you won't always be rewarded right away, but the truth itself is its own reward. That's so incredible. And even when you talk about that piece, Mad at Miles is one of my favorite books by her because as you said, she is addressing Miles Davis directly. He was like the most popular man in music. And she was like, but wait, in your memoir, you said you beat Cicely Tyson. Like, we're going to talk about that and address it head on. I love that you brought that up because that is one of my favorite books by her. And she's giving you the tools to say, like, you can tell your own truth and I'm going to listen to you and it's going to be reciprocal. It means so much. And I've seen you do that publicly and privately for other young people that are trying to figure out the industry and make their own way. What advice do you give to young writers about longevity and building the foundation of their career? I feel like if you tell the story you feel most needs to be written, you will never feel like you've wasted your time. Sometimes people say to me, oh, how do you feel that it was your fourth novel that made you a bestseller? It was your fourth. How do you feel about those other three? And I say, I still love those first three novels as much as I love them when I wrote them because I felt they were the truth that needed to be told. And therefore, I never felt frustrated by my career because I never felt frustrated by my work. Mm -hmm. And I also urge young writers to remember who you're healing with this work. If that book you wrote healed somebody, you're good. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite story. My book, Silver Sparrow, which is about a man who has a secret family. I went to Milwaukee and a woman bought eight copies of the book, eight or nine copies, which is what people do in book clubs. Sometimes they send a representative to get the book signed for everybody. I didn't think much about it. And then I came back on my book tour and the woman was there and she gave me a gift. And she said to me, don't open this until you get back to your hotel. And I said, okay, I thanked her for it. And when I opened it, it was a photograph of about seven or eight people. They were in their fifties, I suppose. And they were all holding the book smiling. I thought they were a book club. But when I read the note that came with it, she explained that when her father died, they found out that he had another family and all these other kids. And so she had this idea that they could read the book together so they could talk about their experience without having to talk about their experience, that the book yes. was a way in for them. And it healed this family. And I felt like Oh, that was why I was called to write this book. I wrote this book for y'all. And I felt completely satisfied with the work I'd done and the way it was received. So Silver Sparrow was a book that didn't even get reviewed by the New York Times. It wasn't in the running for major awards or whatever. But that woman and her siblings, that was my prize. And I think that's what Pearl taught me most is remember why you do what you do. Remember how you felt when a book touched you. You never get touched by a book and flip it over on the back to say, did this book win a prize? It never <laughs> occurred to you. What occurred to you was what you felt. Mm -hmm. And that's the gift. Oh, you are such a skillful writer. And I know people want to hear about how you start. Like, do you map out your writing? Are you an outline person? Like, what does your research look like? What are the do's and don'ts of your writing process? Okay, I don't outline anything because for me, 
If I know where the story is going, you can feel me aiming for it because I'll be trying to set it up. But when I don't know where it's going, I'm writing to explore and I'm more interested. If I knew the end of a book, it would spoil it for me the way it spoils it for you as a reader if someone were to tell you the end. Yeah. And also I write in search of the answer to a question. Now, this is not the most efficient way to write a book. From what I understand, those outliners, they can knock that book out in nine months, 10 months. But for me, it's a growth process and growth takes time and I just have to live with the time it takes. Um, I read everything aloud to hear how it sounds. If I cannot read a, a paragraph out loud, I know that it's clunky. Mm-hmm. If I'm chewing up the words, then I know I've written too many words. Or if I get bored, you get bored reading your own work out loud. That means you got too much description. So some one of these characters need to get in here and do something. Right, right. But all that comes later. I just think that... I just try to learn the most I can as I go. And then I have to go back because when I start the book, the characters are very wooden because it's just like they're people I just met. Right, I don't right. know these people. I'm getting to know them. But then once I've written 100 pages and I know them better, I can come back to what I wrote and embroider it and make it more textured and more dense simply because I know more. Right, right. And you've been able to sit with it in a different way. But it takes a long time. I mean, this is the long, I take the long way, but it works for me. So I wanted to know from writing your first book, Leaving Atlanta, to your latest release, An American Marriage, in that time frame, what is like the one thing that stands out about how your writing has changed, how you have changed as a person? Because I know the essence of you is always there, but has there been something that really feels like, okay, like this is my mark. This is what I always include in every novel, or this is just like my signature. What is the Tiari signature? Well, other people notice things that I never noticed. Like someone wrote me and said, do you like to eat salmon croquettes? And I like salmon croquettes just fine. But apparently somebody in every book is eating salmon croquettes. (laughs) I don't know. Who knew? What's going on in my subconscious? I do not know. Well, obviously all the novels are set in Atlanta. And that's Mm -hmm. a signature for me. And it's an easily identifiable signature. But I think um, an emotional signature is that I have two sisters who are older than me and we weren't raised together because we have different mothers and I've longed for them all my life. And so someone in every book has that situation, whether it be a major character or a side character. I notice I keep bringing that bell and it used to bother me and I would try not to do it because, you know, you think I don't want to be predictable. I don't want people to be able to predict, but I, I let it go. As a matter of fact, I'm working on something now and it's happening again. And that's just how it is. We write toward our obsessions. And the key though, I think in writing, even though you have an obsession, all your books should be different. Even if when you point out that note or that bell you keep ringing, it should be a surprise to a reader. A reader should say, oh my goodness, you're right. Because you're not writing the same book. Mm -hmm. It's almost like if you have a favorite color, it's not like you're wearing the same dress over again, but you like yellow. So you might have a yellow shoe, a yellow belt, yellow nail polish, but you still look different every time. Yes, yes. And I I would say that sisterhood is such a prominent theme in all your books, but they're explored in so many different ways. When I think of, you know, Leaving Atlanta or Silver Sparrow, just like there is this theme. When I think of the word sister, I do think of it as the sibling relationship, but just much deeper, like what it means to be in connection and in love with another woman and feel held by them, like really feel like embraced and held by them. And you articulate that and illustrate that in so many of your books. So how would you define sisterhood? And what what does that mean? How has sisterhood showed up in your life again and again? You give the perfect example of Pearl, but are there other examples of sisterhood that you feel really tied to? Women have taken such good care of me all my life. You know, it probably was most intense when I went to Spelman College, and I didn't even want to go to Spelman. I think about college. Where did I you think want to how, go? I, could, I can't even imagine you anywhere else but Spelman. Me either. But you think about colleges. That's a decision made by teenagers. Teenagers. Teenagers have things based on all kinds of random factors. Um, I went to Spelman because one of my mom's friends taught at Spelman. And she harassed me into applying. And I just applied so she would get off my back. (laughs) And I now know it's this real complicated situation between her and my mother getting me to go there without forcing me to go there. Because if I was forced, I wouldn't go. But at Spelman, I do feel very grateful that my sisterhood, like I have these women literally all over the world who have my back. 
when you take care of each other and you prioritize that other person, like when you show up and you do what needs to be done to help that other person kind of make it over a bridge. But also sisterhood is also also when you're not in crisis, when you just want someone to laugh at what you think is funny. It's an incredible bond to think the same thing is funny. It makes you feel like you share a mind. Mm -hmm. I do think we think about relationships and how people come through when you're in trouble. And don't get me wrong, that's huge. But also sharing in your joy, I think that's important too. After the break, Tiari and I dig deeper into her experience writing an American marriage and talk about her love of letters. Hi, I'm Tiari Jones, and you are listening to Well-Read Black Girl. I'm Glory Edom, and you're listening to Well-Read Black Girl. I'm joined today by New York Times bestselling author Tiari Jones. Tiari was the very first keynote speaker at the inaugural Well-Read Black Girl Festival in Brooklyn, New York in 2015. And we're talking to her about her 2018 novel, An American Marriage. Let's talk about American Marriage. Okay. For people who haven't read it, let me, let me just recap. An American Marriage is a story of a young couple separated by a wrongful conviction. The wife is an artist. Her career is on the up. Her husband is a kind of young executive. His career was just starting. You know, they're about eight or nine years out of college. And right after they get married, he's arrested like a year after they get married. He's arrested for a crime he didn't commit in another state, no less. So it's about their relationship across the miles, across the experience. and just over time. And I didn't know where the story was going. I knew where the story was not going when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I did not want to like update if Beale Street could talk. I did not want to make one woman's brave fight to free her man or like, let's let's celebrate back women by the extent to which they can suffer and sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That to me is one, already told, two, not terribly interesting, and three, not reflective of the way that real people live their lives. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want is to write a novel where I'm not telling people how they should act, but instead exploring the different ways that people behave, the different implications and make us challenge our own beliefs. So she hangs in there for a pretty good amount of time, but it's just a lot. It's a lot. And she has her own dreams. And the question of do Black women have the right to dreams? Like, can you only have dreams if your husband's not in trouble? And in that case, Black women kind of would never be able to dream because in our community, somebody's always in trouble but I didn't know the answer to it. And the thing that surprised me probably the most was how conflicted I was about it. Cause I went in fully believing black women deserve to have dreams. After all, I have a dream. I enjoy my dream. Why would I deprive my fictional character of dreams? But it was as hard for me to write her as it was for her to live her life and make her decisions. So some of the same conflicts and same societal pressure that the character was experiencing based on her decisions, I was experiencing the same pressure about writing her decisions. Mm. Isn't that weird? Like, I remember I was at a party and this guy, he asked me, you know, what are you working on? And I told him I'm writing about this woman. Her husband's wrongfully in prison. And he said, oh, you're going to write about how she's holding him down. I was like, well, I'm really writing about really complex things. Da, da, da. And he said, does she hold him down? I said, well, she does find love somewhere else. This man took his little tiny reception plate and his little reception glasses, wine, and walked away from me. Like he didn't even like the idea that I was thinking about it. Like I do not have a husband in prison. So I did not find new love while my husband is in prison. These are imaginary people. Just engaging it caused him to walk away from me. Mm. And that surprised me how passionate and angry some people were at this book. And that was my first time experiencing that with readers. that They get mad at me. But then other people were really supportive. So it all worked out, but it was a lot. Well, that brings me to the other side of it. Like, how was it crafting the male characters in American Marriage? Was it a deliberate choice to make that voice feel authentic and uh, have, the, you know, the presence of the, the fathers involved? Because there's like two sides of it. You can see the story as a story of masculinity as well. 
I will say my first time I wrote it through, I wrote it all through from the woman's point of view only. I liked it. I dug it and nobody else dug it. Everyone kept saying, well, what about her husband? And I got defensive because I said, I know a lot of male writers and nobody ever tells them they need to rewrite their story from the point of view of the wife ever. But here's an important thing to know about writing. You can take advice like if you let's say you're a painter. If someone doesn't like your painter and you revise your painting, you can never have your original back because you've changed the painting forever. Mm-hmm. Writing is not like that. If you change the writing and you don't like what you've done, you can always go back to an earlier draft. So the only thing you risk when you make changes is your ego to say that maybe someone else was right. So I rewrote the story. I wrote the whole thing from Roy's perspective and it didn't take long at all. And I was wondering why I was able to do it so quickly. And I was able to do it so quickly because I think that man's story is a story we know. That man is in prison. What does he want to get out of prison? What else does he want? His wife back. So his motives and needs were much more straightforward than hers because his situation was so dire. But I did have fun getting his voice and idiom together. I like to think that I am now fluent in dude. I speak dude. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Um, Even though American marriage is also just the challenging subject, I feel like you inject a lot of humor into it as well. And even listening to you, you're funny. You're a very funny person. (laughs) And how were you able to balance that? Well, life is funny. I feel like if your story isn't a little bit funny, it isn't true to life. And I also think it's very important that Black people laugh because they think it's funny. I disagree that Black people laugh to keep from crying because that Mm -hmm. implies that we're always almost crying. Sometimes things are just, some things are just funny and I don't hold that back. I had to learn though. I had to learn to be okay with humor and also to focus so closely on relationships, particularly as a woman writer, there is a sense that women writers write about feelings and that our work isn't as serious. That And some people in their feedback on an American marriage, they wanted less relationships, more racism. Right. But I feel that that's not my job as a writer. My job as a writer is to tell people stories, not to shine a light on racism only. Because think about your real life. In your real life, you focus on your relationships. When you think about what you're going to do today and how you're feeling today, it's about the other people in your life. You do not sit around all day shining a light on racism. Right. Because racism is so ubiquitous. You don't have to look for it. It's going to show up. You don't have to go find it for your story. But when the draft is done, take some of the humor out. It can get too funny. (laughs) Because (laughs) when you write, you lean on the thing you do well. Whenever the draft has a lot of whatever your superpower is, it's because you're having trouble with that section and you're using your superpower to get you through And that's actually a warning sign to you to visit that section more closely Mm. and figure out. Why? It's just like in real life. You know how funny people, when things get really dicey and they don't know how to what to say or what to do, instead of having an authentic interaction with you, they'll make a joke. You do that on the page too. But the good news is about the page, you can revise it and you don't have to go out in the world with that joke where there d- didn't need to be a joke. Yeah. It's like your coping mechanism. <laughs> yeah. And everyone yeah. has them in writing. I tell my students, everyone has like the people who are really good at dialogue, they'll over dialogue at a hard part in a story because that's what they do. I would also love to talk about the format, just like the structure of the letters, how you, you decided upon that, because I feel like that is just one of the most effective ways just to convey the emotion of the characters. It's so beautifully done. Well, I love letters, but you know, the thing is people don't write letters anymore. As a person that writes a lot of letters and I probably get back one letter for every five I write. I got a couple of regular pen pals who write me, but like people don't write back and I don't like people to feel they're in letter debt. I tell Mm. people that all the time. You are not in debt. You don't have to write me back. You can call me. You can email me. Just because I'm into letters doesn't mean you have to be into letters. What keeps you writing when you know the response is unlikely? I just enjoy doing it. Okay, like back to the book. A novel about prison is the only place where you could realistically have exchange of letters because people in prison, letters mean a lot to them for three reasons, right? They want the information you're sharing in the letter. They want to know that you thought about them to send the letter so they appreciate it as a gesture. And thirdly, the letter itself is a souvenir. They can carry it around with them. Is a tangible reminder of the relationship. Well, for me, as the writer of the letter, it works those three ways for me, but I enjoy um, sharing whatever information I'm sharing. 
I want the person to know I'm thinking of them. And I appreciate the physicality of the letter that I'm sending. Like I, you know, I like to have a good looking envelope. I'm serious about my stamps. I'm I'm down with stickers now. Like I like to send the letter as a gift, a physical gift to a friend. I have this letter that I keep on my vision board in my office that's from you. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Do you mind? Okay. Dear Glory, Saturday was magical. Thank you for all of your love, work that made this possible. So many sisters in the room had never experienced such a critical mass of Black women. I once heard an interview with an astronaut. He was explaining or trying to explain the experience of zero gravity. He finally gave up because we bear the weight of gravity from birth. People who have never been to space can't even imagine weightlessness. Until Saturday, so many Black women had never been in a space where they did not struggle with racism and sexism. You offered us eight hours of weightlessness. Such a gift. Glory, it was a beautiful thing to behold. Love, Tiari. And I promise you, like, I keep this in my office. I keep it next to me all the time. And I think of you so much because your um, belief in me and just, like, your encouragement, like, it's so simple sometimes, just but just so sweet and real. Like talking to you, being your friend has made such a difference in my life. And I'm really grateful for you. I'm re- just like your joy, your your humor, just like everything you do for Black women, whether you're in person holding their hand or you're writing a book for them, it changes people. And I know it's changed my life in such a powerful way. So thank you. Thank you for just doing that for us every day. Well, I just want to say to you, I want to thank you because... The women who are like my age, we did what we could do and we're still doing our thing, but it is so inspiring to see well-read Black girl, like a young Black woman taking the lead, taking the torch and making it bigger. When we had that first well-read Black girl conference and all those Black women from just kind of different walks of life, (laughs) everyone left being so moved, so inspired and so loving. There was not a discouraging word to be heard anywhere. It was truly weightlessness. And I went to Spelman, so I have experienced that Black female environment before, but even I, I had not experienced it in so long, and I had not experienced it with an eye toward the future. So thank you, Glory, for the future. I'm going to write you a letter. (laughs) I'll be waiting on it. (laughs) It's time for rapid fire. Okay. Okay. What is your go-to snack when writing? Grapes. Green or purple? Green. I like green grapes too. Name a book on your nightstand. It's called The Right to Sex. Ooh, what's that about? Okay, let me stop. It's a feminist manifesto. (laughs) It's really interesting. It's very challenging. I recommend it so far. Okay. I have or Waffle House? Uh, They're different. I mean, I hop has better food, but the Waffle House is across the street. So Waffle House, I mean, it's across the street. Okay. 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 I'm going to say IHOP. Even though I'm from Georgia, I'm going to get bold and say IHOP for sure. IHOP. Oh, this is an easy question. So typewriters or computers and why? Typewriters all day. Typewriters all day. Um, I like typewriters. I like making all that racket for one thing. You feel like you're getting something done. Secondly, um, when I use a computer, I type too fast and I don't know what I've written. It's like when you eat so fast. The plate is empty, so clearly you ate it, but you don't remember eating it. You don't remember the flavors. Also, with the computer, I can get upset with myself and press a couple keys and delete a day's work. With the typewriter, I can dramatically pull the paper out, ball it up, throw it away, and then come back and smooth it out and still have it. I love that. It's more the process, the experience of it. I love that. Okay, so I need to, I'm going to go into your playlist. What is your life's theme song? Ain't no stopping us now. Yes. yes. When, when I was writing my first book, I would play it all the time. Be like, yep, yeah, mm-hmm. we're on the move. That's great. We really, really got the group. Yes. Thank you so much, Tiari. Thank you for just giving us so much and being my friend and mentor. I love you. I love you more. And thank you for having me. And I can't wait to see what you do next. 
Tiari Jones is a joy to speak with. I couldn't ask for a better confidant. Before I knew her personally, her words offered me mentorship. They taught me how to be a better friend and a companion. Her books explore what it means to be a daughter of Atlanta, the painful, joyous path to adulthood as a young Black woman. An American marriage reminds me that my gender influences the way I move through this world. Black women are often held to an unfair standard of femininity. Tiari offers us a fuller version of ourselves. An American Marriage by Tiari Jones is out now. After the break, we have a preview from another favorite podcast of mine, WBEZ's Nerdette Podcast. We're ending this episode with a special excerpt from our friends at WBEZ's Nerdette Podcast. It's a show that helps you unwind for the weekend with fun and interesting conversations and recommendations. Nerdette also has a monthly book club. Last year, one of their featured books was the short story collection, The Office of Historical Corrections by Danielle Evans, an awesome book. Here's Nerdette host Greta Johnson talking to Evans. I am one of those people who usually doesn't really connect with short stories. I think often because if I don't really enjoy it, I'm sort of like, why did I bother reading this? And if I did really like it, I'm like, why isn't this just a goddamn novel? (laughs) Um, But there was something about like the bite sized bits that you managed to put together in this book that it was just like, I was just so happy to be on the ride the entire time. And I, I don't know how you did it. I don't know if you can tell me how you did it, but I just <laughs> want to say it's amazing. Well, I'm I'm glad to be converting people to the short story form. I really do. I really do love short stories. I mean, probably I love a collection because I think often when you're writing, you're writing about something that you don't have a clear answer on and Mm. a collection allows you to ask the same question over and over again and answer it different ways and kind of look at it from different angles and so Mm. I think you can see a writer that's kind of thinking about something and not necessarily figuring it out but I like that thinking and I like that conversational space and I like that that range of motion but an individual short story I also think works best when it just has this density you know my favorite not favorite altogether, maybe, but my the people who I sort of admire in the forum and think of as models in the forum are Alice Monroe and Edward P. Jones, who are just magicians with time. Like sometimes you don't even know how they did it, but there's sometimes just the right amount of the future or just the right amount of the past that the story feels like like being alive feels, right? It feels like in any given moment something intense is happening that's capturing your intention, your attention, but there's also all of this history to it that that the characters are carrying into the moment and these slight flashes of what it's all going to mean. And I think when it comes together really well, it feels like you're, you're in all time at once. And that is when a story feels most effective to me because it kind of captures that sensation of all the things happening, but it's all in like one paragraph. Oh my God. That's such a beautiful way of putting that. I completely agree. And I don't know. I mean, so much of life is these like flitting moments where you're going through and having all of these different experiences in any given day. And so to experience that with the collection can be such a delight, too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that my first book was largely coming of age stories. And so a lot of them follow a pretty classic narrative arc, right, where Mm -hmm. the emotional event of the story and the sort of actual event or narrative event or plot event are the same thing, right? Something is, somebody's making a decision or something's happening, Mm -hmm. and that's Mm -hmm. what people are reacting to. And I think these stories are a little bit different, not all of them, but a lot of them, in that sometimes the sort of, the active plot really is about the day-to-day choices being made to evade or avoid the thing that actually matters. And so the moment in the story that's actually where the emotional plot comes to the surface is when someone sort of can't run from the thing that matters anymore. (laughs) So it's a kind of different narrative shape, but I had fun with it. And I think maybe amplifies that sort of sense of there is a surface plot that sometimes just does feel like somebody kind of going through their day to day and there's something underneath it. And it sort of comes closer and closer to the surface as you get closer and closer to the end of the story. That was Danielle Evans talking to Greta Johnson on WBEZ's Nerdette podcast. 
You can find that conversation and many, many more wherever you find podcasts. In our final episode of this season, I'll be joined by the one and only Viola Davis to discuss her incredible career and, of course, her new memoir, Finding Me. The episode is out right now, so keep listening. Well Read Black Girl is a production of Pushkin Industries. It is written and hosted by me, Glory Edom, and produced by Cher Vincent and Brittany Brown. Our associate editor is Keisha Williams. Our engineer is Amanda K. Wang. And our showrunner is Sasha Mathias. Our executive producers are Mia Lobel and Lee Tall Molad. At Pushkin, thanks to Heather Fain, Carly Migliori, Jason Gambrell, Julia Barton, Jen Guerra, John Schnars, and Jacob Weisberg. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WellReadBlackGirl. You can find Pushkin on all social media platforms at Pushkin Pods. And you can sign up for our newsletter at pushkin.fm. If you have a question, a recommendation, or you just want to say hi, email us at wrbg at pushkin.fm. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industry, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you're already a subscriber, make sure to check out my exclusive bookmark series. You'll hear extended interviews with book club members, bookstore owners, and more. And you get to hear what's on my mind, what's on my radar, and of course, what's on my reading list each week. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to listen.